Hi, I'm Dr. Peterson with Region ZMS. Airway management is arguably the single most important skill to develop and maintain as an emergency healthcare provider at any training level. It may seem simple, but airway management should truly be the highest on-scene priority. Here at Region ZMS, we have spent a considerable amount of time reviewing our airway management guidelines to incorporate the latest research and best practices. As always, we want to be sure we are giving you the right tools and training to provide the best possible care for our patients. There are eight guidelines that comprise the airway management section, four adult and four pediatric. The core principles are similar, so I will review them together, and any differences there might be will be highlighted as they come up. It is important to mention that a fundamental principle of airway management is that it is primarily a BLS skill. It is very important to ensure that you can manage an airway with BLS techniques before you consider ALS interventions. Let's start with standard airway management. Guidelines 6 and 36, the adult and pediatric airway guidelines are fairly straightforward. Once you have assessed your patient for obvious life threats, oxygen should only be used if indicated for hypoxia or respiratory distress, and it should be titrated to maintain oxygen saturations greater than 93%. This is especially important for patients with cardiac symptoms as we are learning that unnecessary oxygen may actually be harmful. Ask one of us about that at your next run review or CME session. If further respiratory support is needed beyond standard oxygen, begin with BLS maneuvers such as a jaw thrust or an airway adjunct. Ventilation should be a priority, but it is also important to consider reversible causes such as an opiate overdose or an airway obstruction. CPAP should also be considered early for the alert patient in respiratory distress unless you suspect traumatic injuries or if a pneumothorax might be present. If your patient is still in distress at this point, your next option would be an advanced airway device. If you feel you have exhausted your airway options and are still having oxygenation and ventilation issues, you should consider using guidelines 7 and 37, the adult and pediatric failed airway guidelines. Now when I say failed airway, this does not imply a failure on the part of the provider, but it's rather a failure of the patient's airway to respond to the appropriate management techniques. To manage a failed airway, you should first remove whatever device has already been placed, start over, reposition your patient, and revert back to BLS skills. An oral airway and two nasal airways should be placed, and a two-person bag valve mask ventilation technique utilized. If you still can't move any air, place a King airway or another supraglottic device, even if this was already attempted before. If this is still unsuccessful, you're now in a place you never want to be, at the bottom of the airway algorithm. Just to be clear, at this point, you have a patient who has failed every airway management attempt, you are unable to ventilate or oxygenate, and without further intervention, would die. ALS providers should perform an emergent cricothyrotomy procedure, and BLS providers should transport the patient immediately to the closest emergency department while continuing attempts to ventilate. Keep in mind that the cricothyrotomy procedure should only be performed on an adult patient. Pediatric patients must be managed with attempts at BLS skills at this point. As an additional resource, the back of guidelines 7 and 37 contains several important points and considerations for dealing with a failed airway. Let's move on to guidelines 8 and 38, the adult and pediatric RSI, RSA guidelines. These should be used for patients who require an advanced airway device but are still responsive enough to prevent the placement of the device without medications. The use of these guidelines is restricted to ALS providers and two paramedics must be present on scene in order to perform an RSI or RSA procedure. Now let me pause for a second and make a few comments about this. RSI is a controversial procedure in the current national culture of EMS. Although intubation is considered one of the defining skills of a paramedic, the current research suggests this may not always be in the patient's best interest. There are actually several large EMS agencies across the country that have pulled all endotracheal tubes from their trucks because of this concern. The evidence is even stronger against pediatric intubations by pre-hospital providers, and as such, it would be very difficult to defend a decision to intubate a child if a complication would occur.
A recent survey of national EMS medical directors has revealed overwhelmingly that many agencies are pulling pediatric endotracheal tubes because of the rare occurrence and significant risk associated with this procedure. Now we feel this is predominantly a training issue, but currently it's difficult to justify the training time required to maintain pediatric intubation skills with the low frequency at which it would occur. There are just too many other ongoing training priorities at this time. This is an ongoing discussion and may change if video laryngoscopy becomes more affordable. In the meantime, pediatric patients requiring advanced airways should be managed with a supraglottic device, either the King Airway or an LMA. If an appropriately sized device is not available, typically if the child is younger than two, BLS airway techniques should be used. Now once the decision has been made to RSI an adult patient, you should refer to the 12-step RSI checklist we have developed. This should be readily accessible with your airway equipment. Guidelines 8 and 38 address each of the 12 checklist items and divide the responsibilities among four providers. By assigning specific roles to each provider, you will ensure that the critical tasks are addressed, expectations are consistent, and the risk of a complication due to human error will be reduced. Now before you proceed, you should ask yourself if you are reasonably confident you can intubate this patient. And if not, are you able to manage the airway with BLS techniques or is an advanced airway still in the patient's best interest? There are several difficult airway prediction tools you can use which are listed on the back of the airway guidelines. Now at this point, the four roles should be assigned and the pre-RSI checklist should be reviewed. One EMT should be assigned to pre-oxygenate the patient, while the second EMT attaches all of the monitoring devices including cardiac, blood pressure, SpO2 detector, and an end tidal CO2 detector which is critical for confirming proper tube placement. Pre-oxygenation can be achieved with a non-rebreather mask if the patient is spontaneously breathing and has oxygen saturations greater than 94%. If not, a bag valve mask should be used to assist the ventilations until the SATs reach at least 95%. A nasal cannula should also be placed on the patient with a flow rate of at least 6 liters per minute. This will help maintain oxygenation during the intubation attempt. One paramedic should assume the airway role and prepare the appropriate equipment. You should ensure that primary and backup supplies are available, including multiple tube sizes, laryngoscope blades, suction, both manual and electric, basic airway adjuncts, and a bougie. The other paramedic should assume the role of medication administration and ensure that vascular access has been obtained. The RSI medication should then be chosen and drawn up, confirming the doses with the airway medic. Ketamine is the preferred sedative for RSI unless you are concerned about a heart problem as the underlying cause of your patient's status. Ketamine will increase the heart rate and blood pressure, which would add unnecessary strain to an already injured heart. Etomidate would be the preferred sedative in this case. Doses can be calculated out at 3 mg per kilogram for ketamine or 0.3 mg per kilogram for etomidate. But to simplify things, you can also use the pre-calculated small, medium, or large doses based on your estimate of the patient's size. For the paralytic medication, succinylcholine is preferred because of its rapid onset and short duration of action. It will cause a very slight rise in the potassium levels, so if any concern exists for kidney failure or high potassium, vecuronium should be used instead. Vecuronium should be considered any time a dialysis shunt is present, a neuromuscular disorder is present, or if you note EKG changes such as tall T waves or a wide QRS complex. Succinylcholine is dosed at 2 mg per kilogram, vecuronium at 0.1 mg per kilogram, or again, you can use the pre-calculated small, medium, or large doses. Once the medications have been pushed, the oxygen sats should be monitored continuously and called out every 10 seconds or whenever they change. Cricoid pressure can be considered but should only be used if the airway medic feels it would enhance their view of the vocal cords. Now a key point here is that we would like the oxygen saturation to be greater than 94% before an intubation attempt is performed. Below this, the oxygen reserves in the lungs and the blood have already been depleted and your patient will quickly desaturate during the intubation attempt.
If supplemental oxygen does not raise the saturations, a bag valve mask should be used to ventilate until the oxygen saturation improves. If you cannot maintain sats above 94%, you should really consider placing a King Airway as your primary device rather than attempt endotracheal intubation. If at any point in the intubation process the sats drop below 90%, you should immediately abort the attempt and begin manually ventilating with a bag valve mask until the sats improve. After two unsuccessful intubation attempts, you should revert to your backup airway device. Now once your patient's airway has been secured, you should refer to guidelines 9 and 39 for post-intubation management. End tidal CO2 monitoring is mandatory with all advanced airway placements and should be one of the methods used to confirm appropriate device placement. After the airway device has been secured, make sure that your patient is adequately sedated. If ketamine was used, most likely you will have 20 to 30 minutes before additional medications are needed, which in many cases may get you to the hospital. If further sedation is required, fentanyl and Versed would be preferred unless your patient is hypotensive, in which case additional ketamine can be given. You can refer to the guidelines for appropriate dosing, but also note that each medication can be repeated every 10 minutes as needed to maintain sedation. If at any point you develop difficulty ventilating an intubated patient, refer to the right side of the post-intubation guideline for advice and consider the dope mnemonic. Dislodgement, obstruction, pneumothorax, and equipment failure. You should also check your oxygen supply, ensure that your patient is adequately sedated, and place a gastric tube to decompress the stomach, especially if bag valve mask ventilations were provided prior to the intubation attempt. If your patient is attempting to self-extubate or their lack of sedation is preventing adequate ventilations, consider using vecuronium to medically paralyze the patient to facilitate safe ventilations. It is a very effective paralytic but should not be routinely used unless there is a clear indication. Additional sedation should always be given whenever vecuronium is used because it really doesn't have any inherent sedative properties. Once the airway has been secured, make sure the patient is being ventilated at an appropriate rate to maintain a normal end tidal CO2 level. These guidelines are very important and should be familiar to all providers regardless of training level. Airway management is a skill that requires ongoing training and education even for physicians. Your documentation should reflect your critical decisions, assessments, and steps taken to ensure that the procedure was performed safely. And as always, the staff at Regions EMS would be more than happy to answer any questions or concerns you have.